Now let's go on to stanza 5. Now he again addresses this lady and he, he here he doesn't say O lady, instead he calls her O pure of heart, thou needst not ask of me what the strong music in the soul may be, what and wherein it does exist. This light, this glory, this fair luminous mist, this beautiful and beauty making power. So this lady, uh, maybe she is sitting in front of him and he is talking to her. That is how we picture this whole thing. And so he says, he calls her, oh, pure of heart. Lady with a very pure heart, very innocent, very simple. He says, now don't look at me and ask me about this music. Which music is this? It is the music that he spoke about in the previous stanza. He spoke about uh, from the soul itself must there be sent sweet and potent voice of its own birth of all sweet sounds, the life and element. So it is that music he is talking about here. He says, please don't ask me, you don't ask me what this music is or what it is because I don't know what and wherein it that exist. This light, this glory, this, this luminous mist this beautiful and beauty making power. So please don't ask me questions about any of these things. Joy virtuous lady, joy that never was given save to the pure and in the purest hour, life and life's effluence, cloud at once and shower. Joy lady is the spirit and power which wedding nature to us gives in dower, a new earth and new heaven, undreamt of by the sensual and the proud. So he says, don't ask me about any of these because I don't know an answer. And he says, this all comes from joy, virtuous lady, joy that never was given. And so he says, this is, a, it all emanates from joy. And this joy is not given to everybody, but it is given only to the pure, the people who have a pure heart, save to the pure, except to the pure in their purest hour life and life's effluence. So it is uh, this joy that makes us experience life and this joy is an effluence of life. Effluence is an overflow, an abundance of a kind of joy. Cloud at once and shower. It is a cloud and the shower at once. We know that the cloud uh, gives birth to the shower but you can't differentiate the cloud and the shower joy la joy lady is the spirit and the power which wedding nature to us gives in dawa. and he says that this joy this spirit and this power we get it as dawa. Dawa is dowry when you get wedded to nature if you understand nature if you blend yourself with nature this joy and the music that was mentioned earlier, all that comes along with it as dawa. A new earth, a new heaven, undreamt of by the sensual and the proud. And so he says, this new earth and new heaven, which is full of glory and light and uh, such a, an effluence of joy and music, that is not meant for the sensual and the proud. Sensual people who are lost in the sensual pleasures, who do not see beyond the body and proud people who think very high of themselves. He says that this pure joy is not meant for people who are sensual and proud. Joy is the sweet voice, joy the luminous cloud we in ourselves rejoice and thence flows all the charms or ear or sight all melodies the echoes of that voice all clouds a suffusion from that light so she he hopes that uh, once you get this joy once you experience this joy which is a luminous cloud which is a sweet voice we can all rejoice and once we achieve this or once we experience this, then flows all the charms or your, so then everything that you see around you would become charming. All melodies, the echoes of that voice. So every beautiful sound that you hear would be the echo of that voice. 
all colors as a fusion from that light and all the colors that you see around you whether it is the color of the trees the leaves the flowers the rainbow the lake the waters everything would be a suffusion of that light which light that light that emanates from our inner soul so he hopes that he uh, he hopes that the joy engulfs him too and he knows that only the purest of the pure can get it he just hopes that he too will be able to experience it now going on to stanza 6 he says There was a time when though my path was rough this joy within me dallied with stress and all misfortunes were but as the stuff when fancy made me dreams of happiness for hope grew round me like the twining vine and fruits and foliage not my own seemed mine but now afflictions bow me down to earth nor care i that they rob me of my mirth but oh each visitation suspends what nature gave me at my birth my shaping spirit of imagination for not to think of what i needs must feel but to be still and patient all i can and happily by abstruse research to steal from my own nature all the natural man this was my sole resource my only plan till that which suits a part infects the whole and now is almost grown the habit of my soul so he tells us that earlier there was a time when he used to be a happy man there was a time though my path was rough he says i had gone through a lot of difficulties because uh, as mentioned earlier coleridge had a very uh, difficult life he had a lot of physical ailments troubling him and he also had other issues like financial problems his life was not at all easy poverty or often uh, you know posed a very big threat to him and his family so he says though my path was rough this joy within me dallied with distress those days i had this joy you remember the joy that he spoke about in the previous stanza that joy that gives color to everything the joy that lends music to everything he says i had that joy within me and that joy dallied with distress so when even when i had distress this joy kind of dallied with it dallied means played with it and somehow i came out of all that because of the presence of this joy and all misfortunes were but as a stuff where fancy made me dreams of happiness so he says even misfortunes were short lived they were just like dreams for me like dreams uh, because my fancy i just fancied that all these problems were short lived and they just left me and went off nothing could weigh me down as they do now for hope grew around me so what was special those days hope was there i had hope in life so the greatest joy then was that he had hope and you know that a human uh, being cannot go forward in life without hope so he says then i had hope and hope grew around me like the twining vine so that's a very reassuring picture hope growing around you like a vine and fruits and foliage not my own seemed mine and so everything there he saw fruits around him foliage you know are the leaves of the trees so they all grew around him and though he knew it did not belong to him everything seemed to be his because those days he was very happy with himself and he was very happy with all that he saw around him so he derived a lot of joy from the things that he saw and experienced but now now things have changed but now afflictions bow me down to the other afflictions afflictions can be diseases sickness and happiness fear hopelessness all that he says but now afflictions bow me down to the earth i have been overburdened i am suffocated i am smothered down by um, my afflictions both mental and physical 
nor care that they rob nor care i that they rob me of my mirth and he says i have no complaints that i have lost my joy mirth is joy happiness so i have no complaints that they have taken my joy away from me but i am complaining about something else what is that so he says what i really am worried about is that i am losing my imagination each visitation suspends what nature gave me at my birth my shaping spirit of imagination so he says my greatest wealth was my imagination but every time i can feel that my imagination is just fading away it's just uh, disappearing that is what frightens me now he goes on to say for not to think of what i needs must feel and to be still and patient all i can so he says that uh, i try not to think of uh, like i sh- being a poet i should be able to feel what i think a poet should be able to experience his thoughts it's not just thinking but the feeling also should be accompanied by the thought and uh, he says he is not able to do that but to be still and patient all i can and happily by abstruse research to steal from my own nature all the natural man this was my sole resource my only plan till that which suits a part infects the whole, the whole and now is almost grown in the habit of my soul so he says that he has been losing he uh, my his shaping spirit of imagination and he has been trying by abstruse research abstruse research here means by philosophy he has been engaging himself in philosophical reading and research in order to steal from his own nature all the natural man so in order to kind of overcome the loss that he has been experiencing uh because imagination he could feel was slowly leaving him and he was trying to compensate that by uh getting involved in abstruse research this was my sole resource my only plan he says uh, till that which suits a part affect infects the whole and now is almost grown the habit of my soul so he says grief that which affects a part uh, what he means there is grief so grief usually is something that affects only a part of you in the sense that when you feel sad it uh, that feeling of sadness affects only your heart and your mind or the soul but now what has happened is this uh, grief this grief without a pang as he mentioned earlier that has infected his whole being his body and his soul have been a uh, corroded by this overpowering overburdening and smothering sense of unhappiness and gloom now going on to stanza 7 he says hence viper thoughts that coil around my mind reality's dark dream i turn from you and listen to the wind which long has raved unnoticed so he says hence viper thoughts viper is a poisonous snake so he says uh, he tries to get rid of he tries to chase away the viper thoughts that coil around my mind so just imagine uh, it's a very frightening picture actually uh, his mind or his heart around it you see these poisonous snakes coiling earlier just uh, i think in the previous stanza we had another picture of a twining vine that gro- hope grow around me like a twining vine he said and fruits and foliage not my own seemed mine so there it was a very happy picture a positive picture but here we see the coiling snakes the snakes that coil around his mind so those are thoughts of dejection unhappy thoughts that's why he calls them viper thoughts he says hence means go away viper thoughts that coil around my mind reality's dark dream so reality the reality that he has lost his imagination or that he is losing his poetic powers it kind of coils around his mind disheartening him suffocating him so he tries to shake himself free of all those evil thoughts 
I turn from you and listen to the wind which long has raved unnoticed. So he says, for some time I am going to turn away from you. You here means these unhappy viper thoughts. And I am going to listen to the wind. And the wind has been raving unnoticed. Now, earlier you remember in the first stanza, it was mentioned that since the new moon sits with the old moon on, in her lap, very soon there would be wind and storm. Same way now, here we can see that by now, uh, the wind has, the strong winds and the storm has arrived and he was lost in his thoughts. He was telling us about what was happening to him and he had not noticed the wind. But now he says, let me take my mind away from these disturbing thoughts and let me now try to listen to the wind which long has raved unnoticed. What a scream of agony by torture lengthened out that lute sent forth. So he says that the sound of the wind it sounds that it, it, it feels like a scream of agony, a prolonged scream uh, that is that comes from a long drawn suffering as if somebody is being tortured. What a scream of agony by torture lengthened out that lute sent forth. Thou wind that ravest without bare crag or mountain turn or blasted tree or pine grove with a woodman ever clomb or lonely house long held the witch's home methinks were fitter instruments for thee so he says he tells the wind this is not the place where you should be raving and ranting there are other places which are more suitable for your performance so why don't you go there and he suggests some places, bare crag, crags are uh, rocky mountains and hills where there are no trees or vegetation. So he says go to a place, a mountain is a rocky place or a mountain ten. Ten is a word that means a mountain lake. So in some a mountain surrounded lake, go there or blasted tree. A tree that has already been destroyed by uh, lightning. A pine grove with a woodman never clomb. So go to a very dense pine grove where no woodman, woodman, maybe a woodcutter, a man who goes to the forests to uh, collect plants or to cut trees. So uh, uh, why don't you go to the deep forest, the deep den forests where no woodman has yet reached clomb only means climbed the past tense of climbed okay or lonely house or better still there might be some uh, haunted houses long held the witches home which people believe uh, is the home of uh, uh, the witches so why don't you find such a place and go and play your disturbing music there this is not the right place for you so he tells he tries to dismiss the wind the ranting raving wind and tells the wind to go away to all these any of these places but not here mad lutenist lutenist here again it is the reference to the wind lute is the instrument that a lutenist plays and so he calls the wind mad lutenist who in this month of showers of dark brown gardens and of peeping flowers make us devil's yule with worse than wintry song the blossoms buds and timorous leaves among so he says you you go away from here because these places, the places mentioned earlier, the crag, the mountain tent, the blasted tree, the haunted house, me things were fitter instruments for thee. So you can go there and in this month of showers, now this is the month of showers, a rainy season of dark brown gardens because all the leaves, it's almost autumn time and so there are heavy showers, the green leaves have disappeared all that remains are brack, uh, dark brown gardens because all the green leaves and the flowers have gone and of peeping flowers why peeping flowers because the flowers too have started disappearing here and there you might find just a few of them make us devil's yule yule again is something associated with uh, christmas the devil's yule and so the the music the the noise that you're making now 
you uh, better go and make it in some other place with worse than wintry song the blossoms buds and timorous leaves among so you may go and make all these noises among the blossoms and buds and the timorous and the trembling leaves so leave from here thou actor perfect in all tragic sounds thou mighty poet even to frenzy bold what tellest thou now about so he uh, calls the wind an actor because the wind is making all sorts of noises it's moaning it's screaming uh, it's kind of writhing as if in pain it's roaring that is why he says thou actor perfect in all tragic sounds thou mighty poet even to frenzy bold what tell us now about so what are you trying to what story are you trying to tell us now tis of the rushing of an of an host in rout with groans of trampled men with smarting wounds at once they groan with pain and shudder with the cold so the noise of the wind it reminds him of a battlefield of a battlefield where the soldiers are uh, the defeated soldiers are running around and the others are chasing them with and you can hear the groans of trampled men with smarting wounds wound from which blood is oozing at once they groan with pain and they shudder with cold so the un, the unpleasant noises of the wind reminds him of all the, of this battle scene so what are you trying to do what are what story are you trying to tell us are you talking trying to remind us about a battle at once they groan with pain and shudder with cold but hush there is a pause of deepest silence and all that noise as of a rushing crowd with groans and tremulous shudderings all is over and he says but suddenly the sound stops and there is a pause of deepest silence and all this noise as if uh, mad crowds of people were rushing forward with the groans and shudderings everything is over suddenly there is silence so the storm has kind of subsided suddenly it tells another tale with sounds less deep and loud a tale of less affright and tempered with delight as otway's self had framed the tender lay tis of a little child upon a lonesome wild not far from home but she had lost her way and now moans low in bitter grief and fear and now screams loud and hopes to make her mother hear now this again is a reference to a poem by otway where a child was lost in the storm now this some of you must have read uh, the poem lucy gray written by wordsworth that also has a very a similar story about a child a girl who uh, on a stormy evening uh, um, took a lamp and went out to guide her mother because her mother was working somewhere down the hills and so since a storm was kind of brewing up so the child had gone out with a lantern to guide the mother home uh, but unfortunately the storm grew really violent and the mother reached home and the parents were wandering around looking for the child because she had not returned and they found her footsteps still uh, the wooden bridge across a stream but then after that um, the footsteps just disappeared uh, telling us that maybe the child had fallen into the river and was drowned to death and it is also uh, said in that poem in lucy gray that even now uh, some people say that they can hear uh, the cry of lucy gray and so the otway story is something very similar to that and so uh, he says for uh, uh, th- that is why he calls the wind a great actor because earlier it was making all sorts of groaning noises of uh, groaning and moaning and shouting and screaming but then suddenly he says he can hear another sound and uh, the wind seems to stop and then uh, you can hear the sound of a little child upon a lonesome wild not far from home but she hath lost her way and now moans low in bitter grief and fear now screams aloud and hopes to make a mother hear so now the wind 
uh, it imitates the sound of this little girl who is lost in the storm and who is crying out of grief and fear. So uh, the wind that blows around the house it seems to assume various roles and it reminds uh, Coleridge of all these stories. So that is what happens in stanza 7. Now let's go on to stanza 8. Tis midnight, but small thoughts have I of sleep. Full seldom may my friend such vigils keep. Visit her gentle sleep with wings of healing. And may the storm be but a mountain birth. May all the stars hang bright over her dwelling. Silent as though they watched the sleeping earth. So he says, it is midnight, but small thoughts have I of sleep. It is midnight, but he is not able to sleep. Sleep uh, has eluded him and he is sitting there lost in all these unhappy thoughts. And so he says, uh, though I am not able to uh, sleep, please let my dear friend, this dear friend here is the lady that we mentioned earlier, let her sleep. Full seldom may my friend such vigils keep. Vigil is keeping watch without sleeping. That is what you would call a vigil. Okay, waking up throughout the night and keeping guard uh, or looking over somebody. And so here she, he, he hopes fervently that let my friend not experience such sleepless, sleepless nights. Full seldom may my friend such vigils keep. In, in the sense, may my friend never have such vigils to keep. Let her sleep peacefully. So, he requests, he entreats with sleep, gentle sleep. He says, please visit her with wings of healing. And may the storm be but a mountain birth. May all the stars hang bright above her dwelling. So, let this uh, storm be confined only to these mountains where I live but above her house let the stars shine bright let there be no wind no storm please visit her with wings of healing we know that sleep is uh, it, it has a healing power when you sleep well uh, your pains your uh, sorrows are all kind of alleviated if sleep has sleep is a soothing kind of a balm and so that is why he says please visit her with wings of healing may the storm be but a mountain birth may all the stars hang bright above her dwelling or her house silent as though they watched the sleeping earth so let them watch over her as they would watch over the sleeping earth with light heart may she rise, gay fancy, cheerful eyes, joy lift her spirit, joy attune her voice. To her may all things live from pole to pole, their life the eddying of her living soul. So he wishes all good things upon this friend of his. He says, let her sleep well, let her wake up as a happy person. With a light heart may she rise. Let her fancy, let her imagination be filled with gay thoughts, gay in the sense happy thoughts. May her eyes be cheerful, may they get to see cheerful scenes, happy things. Joy lift her spirit. You remember this joy? This joy is the joy that he spoke about earlier, the joy that he lost, the joy that comes from somewhere deep within which bubbles up. So. Let her experience that joy, let the joy lift her spirit, let the joy attune her voice. Again, recall the music that he spoke about, the music, uh, the life-giving music. So let the music attune her voice. To her may all things live from pole to pole. All things live maybe from pole to pole. So let her find happiness everywhere. Let everything be lively to her. And their life, the eddying of her living soul. So let her soul be uh, ennobled by all that she sees around her. Uh, of O simple spirit, guided from above, dear lady, friend of de friend, devoutest of my choice, thou mayest thou thus mayest thou ever evermore rejoice. So 
all that he has lost or all that he cannot experience he wishes fervently that his dear friend may enjoy all that so o oh, simple spirit guided from above dear lady so he calls her the simple spirit because she is pure at heart as he mentioned earlier only the pure at heart can experience this joy so she is a very pure person a simple spirit she is guided from above that is she is blessed by god so let her be happy friend devoutest of my choice thus may as thou ever ever more rejoice so may you always be happy not only now but ever ever more be happy and always continue to be blessed by this life giving joy and this harmonious music that makes life worth living okay so um, this is the poem dejection and ode and uh, it is in fact a very sad poem in the sense that uh you can imagine the agony the poet must be going through um because for a poet his inability to feel his inability to be sensitive uh or his uh, incapability to react to the things that he sees that is such a curse because that means that he cannot be a poet anymore and that is the phase that coleridge is going through and all his anguish can be seen in this uh, poem but in spite of that he finds the good will in his heart to wish happiness for another person that is definitely an ennobling feeling though he is unhappy he says i am kind of uh, fated to experience this uh, sad uh, to at least to go through this sad phase of my life my imagination has abandoned me but please he he tells nature he requests the stars he requests the wind uh, please take care of my friend let her be happy uh, let her rejoice let her continue to have a very peaceful life so that brings out the innate goodness of the man and it also expresses the love that he has for this lady so this again is a beautiful ode and um it is as i mentioned at the right at the beginning of the poem it is counted as one of the best odes of english literature